Welcome to A Fork in Time, the alternate history podcast. The Mayflower Compact, in the name of God, amen. We, whose names are underwritten, the loyal subjects of our dread sovereign Lord King James, by the grace of God, of Great Britain, France, and Ireland, King, Defender of the Faith, etc., having undertaken, for the glory of God and advancements of the Christian faith and honor of our King and country, a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia, do by these presents, solemnly and mutually, in the presence of God and one another, covenant and combine ourselves together into a civil body politic for our better ordering and preservation and furtherance of the ends aforesaid, and by virtue hereof to enact, constitute, and frame such just and equal laws, ordinances, acts, constitutions, and offices, from time to time, as shall be thought most meet and convenient for the general good of the colony, unto which we promise all due submission and obedience. In witness whereof, we have hereunto subscribed our names, at Cape Cod, the 11th of November, in the year of the reign of our sovereign lord King James, of England, France, and Ireland, the eighteenth, and of Scotland, the fifty-fourth, in the year of our lord, 1620. The audio that you heard read just there, courtesy of Timeless Reader One on YouTube, is of course the text of the Mayflower Compact from 1620, and thought that the actual text of the document, uh, especially so eloquently and simply read, would be a good way to start our episode here today on A Fork in Time, the Alternate History Podcast. Don sitting in the host chair today, and as you might have guessed, our topic today is going to center around a document that was executed in November of 1620 that is known as the Mayflower Compact. And our historical what if today is going to center around what if there had not been a Mayflower Compact. And we'll see how it's relevant not only to uh, being a foundational document in American history, but conceptually the type of document that it is is also unique in introducing something that is new into Western democratic thought. And so today on A Fork in Time, we'll pick this back up after the break, we will look at the historical what if of what if there had not been a Mayflower Compact. Talk to you soon. Here's Don. And Alexis. Taking just a quick break from the podcast today to tell you about, again, something that is relatively new for us. Uh, So what is this new exciting thing that we're sort of pumped about? Merchandise. Merchandise. We're a podcast. They can have those. They can have items. Wow. This opens up a whole new world, world of possibilities. And so what we're referring to here is the fact that you may have been craving, absolutely craving, wondering how in the world you could get your hands on what? Maybe a a fork in time. T-shirt. Or coffee mug. Yeah, coffee mug is a big thing for me. Or maybe even a cell phone cover or a tote bag or any of the other types of things. The good news is now you're able to do that. And we found a way to do that that works well for us and we think that will work well for you. So one of the folks that we partnered with is T Public. And TeePublic is actually a place for designers to sort of post things that are, are graphical or art-oriented. I got this idea from another podcast that does this. So we're able to have our logo as an option that you can then put on the various TeePublic apparel. Mm-hmm. So, Alexis, how does it work if you go to our website and click on the link that says Get Some logo Stuff? So when you click on that link, it'll take you to the TeePublic site, and you can pick from... Several different options, which we kind of mentioned, and there are other ones, too. So you can really pick what you want with our logo on it. And then when you purchase that, we actually get a little help. Yeah, it's not a lot. Uh, this is not going to be a... Uh, I'm not retiring on our T Public income no. ever. 
uh, but it does offset a little bit of the cost of the show. But more importantly, it's a way of doing this where we don't have a lot of upfront cost in terms of printing, you know, a thousand t-shirts because that's the way you get the best right. So it's just a good way of doing that, taking advantage of the mechanism that TeePublic has in place. So if you enjoy the show and you want to rep the show to those around you, you have a way to do that through logo apparel and items and all kinds of other stuff and you can find how to get there by going through the website so one more time what is our website address lex that is a fork in time podcast.com you can use that merchandise and also it'll help you start a conversation with somebody about the podcast hey, too hey there's an idea so we hope that you do thanks <laughs> welcome back to a fork in time the alternate history podcast don sitting in the host chair today and flying the what if machine solo uh, and today's topic is sort of relevant to the fact that we are celebrating Independence Day, or the, or the period of time here of Independence Day in the United States. And so I thought we would take a look today at maybe one of the more obscure documents in American political history, but a very important document. So we're going to take a look today at a historical what-if that centers around the Mayflower Compact. To sort of put things into place, it's important to understand what is the Mayflower <laughs> Why does there need to be a compact, and what is this document all about? How did it come to be? Uh, just taking you back a little bit, remembering that back in 1620, a group of settlers had come to the New World, commonly referred to as pilgrims. They had sailed from England to uh, settle in the new uh, British colonies in the Americas. And in fact, they had contracted to come. They were religious and political separatists uh, from from England to settle in the territory that had been granted under the charter by King James uh, that was in the territory that was known as Virginia. So they had contracted with the Virginia Company under the charter that had been issued, which was uh, the charter from the king, to settle in the New World in Virginia. However, as things would have it be in the course of their voyage across the Atlantic, they found themselves not landing in the territory of the Virginia colony or the Virginia Charter area, but in stand landing initially on Cape Cod in the area that we would know today in modern-day Massachusetts. And so this created something of a problem or something of a dilemma for those who had come in the sense that they had not landed where they had expected to land, and as a result, they were not going to be functioning as individuals in terms of how their political organization would work because they were not going to be settling in the area where they originally planned to settle and underneath the charter which had been granted by the king. Uh, the Virginia Company was a private charter that had been granted, but of course all of the charters had the approval of the English monarchs. So having the monarch's approval also meant that you were subject to, and it was clearly understood, what your rights as well as your obligations were in the territory that would come to be known as Virginia. However, in where they were landing, uh, what we now know as modern-day Massachusetts, and this is before the founding of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, this created an interesting situation. They were not going to be landing and settling where they had planned to, and again, under the document and under the understanding, under the charter that they had planned to. So how were they going to govern themselves? And so this led to the group of those who had come, who were there, to actually gather together. And there had been 102 passengers on the, May, on the Mayflower, 50 men, 19 women and 33 young adults and children, only 41 of which were religious separatists. And so this was a diverse group that had come over. And of course, landing in Virginia, that was expected that they didn't necessarily need to all be of the one same mind or the one same idea about both how they would practice their religion and how the local government would work. They were going to be subject to the Virginia regulations. Now, landing in Massachusetts with them being of different backgrounds, having different interests, and in some ways having different thoughts about how this should work, they came together and they actually drafted the document, the document that you heard read. And so that came to be known as the Mayflower Compact, and it came to be the governing document under which the young, newly formed colony, the, new, the settlers that were there, would function, and how they would govern, to some degree govern themselves, but as you heard certainly in the text that was there, uh, that they were doing that under, and that they clearly acknowledged King James. So they were still not declaring themselves, obviously, independent of the king that was in England, but they were clearly recognizing that they needed to form an understanding of how their government would work. So today we're going to talk a little bit about why the document is important by looking at what the historical what-if of not having the Mayflower Compact would be. So first of all, 
While it's certainly not probably as well known as other foundational American political documents or even Western democratic documents in the English tradition, for example, we talk about the Magna Carta, we talk about the United States Constitution, we talk about the Declaration of Independence, uh, we talk about things like uh, um, uh, the various French constitutions, the Declaration of Human, Human Rights, these types of documents, the Mayflower Compact sort of often in many cases, sort of slides underneath the radar. And so thinking about what it would be like without it, I think, is a good way to approach and understand its significance. Uh, I mentioned the Magna Carta. Almost everyone, you know, obviously, in England or in uh, those parts of the world that, dis that descend from uh, English rule and uh, either in a col colonized form or part of the Commonwealth, understand the importance of the Magna Carta. And, of course, the Magna Carta signed in 1215, was the situation there where King John, at the behest of nobles, the barons, and others, other nobility in England, came to an understanding, a written understanding, the Magna Carta being Latin for Great Charter, indicating what their rights would be as nobles when it came to taxation and other types of things relative to the monarchy. Over time, these rights that were originally extended in the Magna Carta to nobles were extended to common citizens, and in many ways the Magna Carta is the foundational document on which the English constitutional concept of democracy is based. Without the formal written constitution, it's one of the documents that forms the principle of English common law. Uh, for example, the idea of a trial by, by peers, trial by jury, uh, the peers there being the nobles who would be the only ones who would be able to try each other. All of this is incorporated in that document, and so it's a foundational document that is either by direct reference or sometimes just informally because of how widely accepted it came to be uh, in the English political descent existed there. When it comes to the Mayflower Compact, certainly it applied only to these approximately 100 settlers that were settling there in the area that we'd come to know as Massachusetts, but the principles that are contained therein are very important. So I'm going to try to imagine how, without a Mayflower Compact, how things might have played forward as we move towards the period of the American Revolution. For example, one of the things that you clearly hear that is outlined in the document is this idea of a form of self-government, that they would have the right to elect representatives, they would have the right to pass laws. They point to two things that they derive these rights from. One of them being, which it starts out with, is being divinely derived, uh, that they are derived from God. And then they're also, they acknowledge and clearly establish their relationship with the King of England. And so, while saying still that they are subject to both God's laws and the King's laws, they also make it very clear in the Mayflower, Com Mayflower Compact that they are within their rights, and it's actually the proper design for this society uh, to uh, elect leaders, to pass laws, to make regulations, to do the types of things that they would collectively do together to form a society and to form how they will govern themselves politically. While looking back on this, this doesn't seem to be like to be a wild, uh, crazy type of thing to suggest. When you think of the time in 1620, the idea that a group of individuals could gather together and choose of their own accord to enter into this type of agreement is unique. Um, there was no direct requirement that they do this. Um, they felt the need to do it because, again, landing outside the jurisdiction of the original charter and the original understanding upon which they were going to be settling the colony, to many suggested that they needed to have something in place so that there was a clear understanding and so that there literally wasn't just a survival of the fittest or a whoever is the strongest will choose and decide what is going to happen. They actually chose to enter into a voluntary understanding with each other. And when you recognize uh, the unique aspect there that less than half, a minority of the 100, were actually the uh, religious separatists that we, that we commonly refer to as the pilgrims, the fact that they contain actually also in this document the understanding that there would be strangers. And by strangers, they, they clearly meant those that would not practice religion in exactly the same way that they would, those that would uh, be more loyal to the Church of England and its form of practice at the time, recognizing their rights to still exist within the colony, to still have representation within the colony, is also an important thing. So you have sort of two very bedrock fundamental principles 
of democracy, particularly American democracy, that find themselves in the expression of this very brief document, the Mayflower Compact. One of those being uh, the right of a degree of self-determination and self-rule, and then the concept of a form of religious liberty and the, and the ability to practice uh, religion openly and freely, regardless of whether that is what the majority wanted to practice. Probably a, a very eloquent and correct summation of that can be found in uh, Rebecca Fraser's book, uh, the Mayflower, the Families, the Voids, and the Founding of America, where she says, quote, Plymouth Colony was the first experiment in consensual government in Western history between individuals with one another and not with a monarch. So as she's indicating there, while the monarch was referenced, and they certainly uh, were not declaring themselves independent of the authority of King James, it is very clear from the words in the document that the consent to these laws came as a result of a mutual agreement. It came as the result of the consent of the governed. In fact, it uh, would be later uh, that um, in 1802, speaking at Plymouth, uh, the location where the colony eventually ends up, uh, that uh, John Quincy Adams, who was not president at the time but become president later, actually said that he was underscoring the importance of the agreement that was signed there on the Mayflower about 180 years earlier, said that, quote, perhaps the only instance in human history of that positive, original, social compact where speculative philosophers have imagined as the only legitimate source of government. What Adams is saying there is that it was very clear that those who signed the Mayflower Compact believed that the government that was being formed and agreed to in that simple document among them just to govern that colony came as a result of them giving their assent, their consent, to be governed. They believed that that was derived, as is clearly stated, part of this because of their religious beliefs, from God, while still acknowledging the monarch. So without the Mayflower Compact, it's maybe a little bit more difficult to imagine where, uh, as we draw towards the American Revolution, the American Revolutionary Founding Fathers would have gone to look for something that represented, in a documentary fashion, the concept that they were trying to bring forth at that time, which was the idea of exactly that, consent of the governed. They didn't have to go far, though. They could actually go back into their own colonial history. In the case of those that were now representing Massachusetts, could go back directly to the territory that they came from. And they could reference the fact that there were those who had come that had become part of the colonies, uh, that were the American colonies, who had formed and agreed to in this case through the Mayflower Compact, the idea of consent of the governed. And so when looking for an example of that, they didn't have to go far. They, they went back some ways in history. Again, going back uh, um, you know, approximately at that point, 150 years, goes back away about 130 years, I guess, actually. 130, 130 to 140 years is going back. But they didn't have to go back far geographically, and they didn't have to go back far in terms of their cultural memory or what had become the, the way that society had formed in the American colonies. So if there is no Mayflower Compact for, for the American Founding Fathers to look to uh, when they're declaring their independence, uh, they don't have the same type of foundation uh, to build the concept of the Declaration of Independence on, which of course also clearly states the, con the other concept that's contained within the Mayflower Compact, compact the idea that the rights are God-given, God-granted rights. And so while the Mayflower Compact acknowledges a king and acknowledges God, it starts with the acknowledgement of God, uh, particularly for these religious separatists that were part of, of the Mayflower um, uh, colonization group. The representation that they believe that those rights were not necessarily granted by the king only, but were God-given and derived human rights that were separate from those that were granted by a monarchy. So when you move forward to the time of the American Revolution, now when you're looking to say, as they as is said in the Declaration of Independence, that there comes a time when it's right to dissolve the bonds, in this case the bonds back to the English monarchy, uh, they actually rely upon the concept that's contained within the Mayflower Compact of the divinely appointed rights uh, as being the source of of their political, the political rights and the political structure. One of the other impactful things I think we can draw by thinking about what 
it would be if there were no uh, Mayflower Compact, is, is the idea that it was actually a written document. As I mentioned before, the Magna Carta was a written document, but the Magna Carta is not the English Constitution. In fact, the English Constitution exists as a body of English common law, a document like the Magna Carta, other acts combined together. These things com- conform and, and create the idea of a written constitution. Uh, the United States Constitution was somewhat unique in the, in, at the time that it came to be in the middle of the 18th century, towards the latter part of the 18th century, in that it represented a written constitution, a written understanding of how things would be ordered and how things would be governed in a sovereign nation, or in that case, a a group of states that were coming together to form a nation. Uh, So at the time of 1620, when the Mayflower Compact is composed and agreed, the fact that it's actually put into writing, they could have come to this understanding orally or verbally. But they felt the need to actually, and they felt the compulsion, to actually put it down in writing and sign their names to it. It was, in some ways, a commercial contract, but at the same time, it was a guiding document. It was a principle, and the the signatures that are on that document are not the signatures of the monarch. I guess that's the important thing to understand. What is unique about that is those who signed their names to the Mayflower Compact, were those who were going to be governed by and who were giving their, again, as I mentioned before, were giving their uh, permission and their accedence uh, to what was going to happen there. When you think about that, and again, how it parallels down to the Declaration of Independence and ultimately to the Constitution of the United States and other American democratic documents and ideals, if there is no Mayflower Compact to point to, what happens, again, when the Declaration of Independence is being considered in the 1770s, and also what happens when it comes time to actually write out first the Articles Confederation and then the United States Constitution to define what this newly independent nation's government is going to be. They had the example of the Mayflower Compact and then other documents that follow after that to point to, and so it was a very logical thing in the American political tradition, as young as the American political tradition was at that time, to think about the fact that this should be in a written, formalized, clearly understood, clearly dictated document. If there is no Mayflower Compact, uh, it's easy to imagine that you might have had something that would have been more along the lines of either the institution of an American monarch or the institution of something in the American political tradition that would have looked a lot more like the English constitutional tradition in terms of not being a single written document. And so, again, without the Mayflower Compact, I think it's doubtful that you have exactly the same form of either the Declaration of Independence or the United States Constitution. And finally, without the Mayflower Compact, I think it's interesting to point that you probably don't have the idea quite as well of the consent of the governed. Uh, It's very clear, as I mentioned before, that while they are giving their allegiance to King James in the document, it is made very clear that these individual citizens of what they will be, of the colony, in fact, they probably didn't even think of themselves as that way at that moment, but the the members of, the participants in the colony, would have that right of self-government. Without the Mayflower Compact, it's very likely that would have developed developed in the Americas. It did develop in the Americas in other types of ways, but it was definitely deep-rooted. It was deep-rooted in so many of the areas because many of the other areas of New England and some of the northern colonies were the results of those who had left um, either the Plymouth Colony or what later became the Massachusetts Bay Colony had left this experience to go elsewhere and very often felt the need to document what their what their governance would look like. And so a precedent was set in 1620 with the Mayflower Compact that became the American political precedent that carries forward. So it's tough to imagine whether that would have happened without the Mayflower Compact, but it's, I think, far less likely that it would have in terms of expressing itself the way that it did. Finally, the last thing that I want to mention, which I think also has an interesting historical, if you will, what-if been to it, is actually where the actual document was signed. We called it the Mayflower Compact. Uh, Those who uh, participated in its formation, its writing, and executed it didn't call it the Mayflower Compact. We call it that because it was actually executed on board the ship, on board the Mayflower itself. Uh, The document was entitled Agreement Between the Settlers of New Plymouth, which was going to be the name of the colony. We call it the Mayflower Compact 
Because the compact was made, the document was drafted while they were still on the ship. Actually, before they had landed and started building the colony, building the settlement, it actually took place on the vessel itself with an understanding of before we actually enter into this endeavor, what's it going to be? I think that's also an interesting what if to consider in the sense that it also was unique as a document in contemplating the need, in this case, almost uh, theoretically, almost philosophically to establish what something was going to be before it was actually in existence. This wasn't because they had tried uh, to govern themselves or, or they had tried to live peacefully for a couple of months and had come into conflict and then as a result of that needed to have a settlement and thus drafted a document about what was happen, what would happen. Uh, that's the case throughout history. In fact, the Magna Carta is that where it's the English uh, English nobility pushing back on King John to say, because you've done this, we're going to force you to sign this charter because you're not going to do this anymore. It was a reactionary document. The unique thing about the Mayflower Compact is that it was not a reactionary document, it was a proactive document. And so thinking about the impact of that, again, moving th forward through American political thought, American political formation, is this idea of proactively addressing the situation before it happens. And you see that actually in much of the design of the United States Constitution, uh, in some ways in response to some of the failures of the Articles of Confederation, obviously, but intentionally thinking through how to balance power and how to share the responsibility for governing. It was a theoretical document before it actually came into practice, and it draws upon the legacy and the history of the Mayflower Compact in order to do that. So if there is no Mayflower Compact to point to to say, before we head down this road, before we do this, let's formulate and establish an understanding of what that's going to be, you would have had a different situation than you do in the real time out of history. And so while today's uh, what-if exploration here might not be quite as what if ish as a lot of things that we do, I think it's an interesting thing to contemplate when thinking about the importance of the 1620 Mayflower Compact, thinking about how history would have been different without it, uh, because its influence is sort of so subtle in the way that it influences uh, the future revelation evolution of American political thought leading towards the revolution, and even the way the documents of the revolution spring into being, it, it's so subtle that it's there that it's, it, it's, it's, we don't think of it as not existing because it's, it has the subtle influence. But without it, things could have been quite different. So once again, thank you for joining us here today on A Fork in Time, the Alternate History Podcast. Hope you enjoyed this brief episode. Next week we'll be back, uh, not in a solo mode, but with a co-host, so looking forward to that. Also, uh, by the time you hear uh, the next episode, we should also have released uh, the first episode of The Room Where It Happened. So we're really excited about that. Uh, ask that you come and check that out as we launch our second podcast endeavor here. Certainly you can interact with us here on A Fork in Time by visiting our website. That's at www.aforkintimepodcast.com. I won't go through all the things that you can do there, but there's lots of stuff to do there, including giving feedback, episode suggestions, and all the other things uh, that we, we often ask you to do on each and every episode. So once again, Don signing off for this episode of A Fork in Time, suggesting that if you happen upon that fork in time, take it. Thanks for listening to A Fork in Time, the alternate history podcast. Learn more and provide feedback by visiting our website at www.aforkintimepodcast.com. Connect to us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash A Fork in Time or follow us on Twitter at A F I T Podcast. If you want to support the show financially, visit our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash a fork in time. We hope you will join us next time.